Amen. So keep your place there in Revelation chapter number six. We're going to be in the book of Revelation for um, the entirety of, well, pretty much the entirety of the sermon. Um, tonight. So we're talking about, we, last week we started the sermon series of Daniel's 70th week. We're looking at the end times 70th week of Daniel. Um, and I preached through the 70 weeks, what that was all about. Um, how there's been um, a 70th week shadow fulfillment um, a couple of times throughout history, but um, we're looking at the end times, Daniel's 70th week, and that's where mainly um, the book of Revelation comes in. Um, a lot of the book of Daniel will be in there as well, but we're going to be in Revelation chapter 6 tonight because we're looking at a very specific event tonight, um, a very specific set of events talked about in the book of Revelation, which are at the beginning of Daniel's 70th week, the end times 70th week called uh, the four, you know, it's in pop culture, it's called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's not what the Bible says. It's the four horsemen or the four horses that have riders in Revelation chapter number six, which starts at the beginning of Daniel's 70th week. So we're in Revelation chapter six. You say, well, what happened so far in the book of Revelation? So let me just summarize it thus far um, for you. The book of Revelation kind of starts out in chapter 1 as kind of an introduction. Um, John sees Jesus. Jesus talks to John. He sees Jesus with, you know, his glorified self with the, the white hair and the eyes flaming, um, the eyes of flaming fire. Um, Revelation chapter number 2, Revelation chapter 3 is, uh, if you have a red letter Bible, those are all red words because Jesus is literally delivering the words that he wants John to deliver to the angels, meaning messengers or the pastors of, in that case, of, that's why I told you that angels is kind of a broad term in the Bible when we talked about the cherubims and seraphims last week. But he delivers the letters to the seven churches, which are very, it's very powerful doctrine for churches today, because that's why Jesus put it um, in the Bible is so we can apply those letters, those were churches um, at that time that were doing things wrong. So we are to always check ourselves against that doctrine that Jesus told the churches that they need to fix. So that's Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 3. And then in Revelation chapter 4, it really gets interesting where, you know, the door of heaven is opened and John appears in heaven you know, as a spirit. Just flip back to Je Revelation chapter 4 real quickly, and let me kind of update you on something that we talked about last Wednesday when we talked about um, the cherubims and the seraphims. So it's interesting. Uh, we talked about the cherubims last Wednesday in reference to, you know, uh, aliens and, and flying saucers and all that um, kind of thing with the wheels. Um, I didn't go into seraphims um, too detailed, but here's an interesting uh, difference between seraphims and uh, cherubims. In Revelation chapter 4, the door of heaven is open, and he sees the throne of God. John sees the throne of God, and there's these four beasts that are around the throne of God. And the Bible is very clear that these beasts have six wings. So these are not cherubims. These are seraphims. And it's interesting because if you look um, and read Revelation chapter 4, just read it through, remember that the cherubims each had four faces, but the, the seraphims have one face, and there's four of these creatures, and each one has a face of, uh, what are the faces? Look at verse number seven. It says, one was the, like a lion, the second was like a calf. Uh, it's called in, uh, in uh, Ezekiel, it's like an ox, calf ox, talking about a, 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 you know, a, a cattle, cow. And the third beast had the face of a man, and the fourth beast was a flying eagle. So... The difference between the seraphims and the cherubims, and I believe the reason you don't see the wheels is because each of these beasts just had its own face, but it still had all four of these animals represented. The lion, the, the, uh, the ox, the bear, and the, um, the lion, the ox, I don't know why I can't remember this, the man and an eagle, okay? Now, um, if you look at the Bible, and I'm going to give you the significance of those four animals. The significance is really the Gospels, is what it's talking about. Those four animals are, you know, basically representing uh, different characteristics of Jesus Christ himself, which makes perfect sense as they're around the throne in heaven. If you look at him, I have written in my Bible right next to verse number seven, basically Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, in that order. So it's interesting, verse number seven literally lists the, um, the animals as the same as the Gospels are listed 
in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Matthew represents Jesus. If you read the Gospel of Matthew, it emphasizes Jesus as the king. Jesus as his, you know, he's the lion of Judah, it says in, I think it's verse, um, it's in verse number five, or in chapter number five of Revelation, he's literally called the lion of Judah, meaning the king. So that's Matthew. Mark focuses on um, what is the, it's, it's the beast like a calf or an ox. It focuses on Jesus, the servant, and the servitude, how Jesus was the servant leader, and really he came here to serve and to do something for the Father and for the earth. And then, of course, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke focuses on Jesus, the Son of Man. It focuses on the, the humanity, the man, um, Jesus, which is, you know, the face as a man. And then the fourth one, of course, is the face of an eagle, which focuses on the Gospel of John, which has heavy emphasis on Jesus, the Son of God. And that's very obvious even in the first chapter of the book of John. So that's kind of why, you know, those animals you see um, in the Bible are there, all right? So again, I think it's interesting that six, six winged beasts are around the throne. Those are seraphims. So that's chapter number four. Chapter number five, we see something um, new intra, you know, introduced, which is this book with seven seals on it. And that's kind of the focus of the sermon this evening is the first four seals of that book. Now, verse number, um, or chapter number five talks about this book and they talk about the book, and no one can open the book, and who can, who's worthy to open the book. And then you see in chapter number 5, in verse number, um, look at verse number 5 of chapter number 5. It says, one of the elders, oh yeah, in verse number 4, in chapter number 4, by the way, you also see, this is interesting to me anyway, you also see these 24 elders around the throne. So you see the four beasts, and you see these 24 elders around the throne with crowns on their head. Now, what's interesting, and I'm not going to get too deep into this, this evening is most people that I have asked to explain when I was in an old IFB church, when I've asked to explain the rapture and end times things, tell me that the 24 elders around the throne here, that is the rapture. That is, which I don't even know what to say about that. That doesn't make any sense on any level, okay? It's 24 elders, specific um, people around um, the throne, it's obviously not every believer that was on the earth at, at that time when Jesus came to get them and bring them back. But I've been told that um, several times by old IFB uh, people in churches and also pastors, all right? So that's what they got right there, okay? And we'll look at another place when we get a couple sermons down the road where the rapture actually is in the book of Revelation, and it is extremely obvious. I mean, you don't have to read the book of Revelation and be a Bible scholar to figure out, you know, a great multitude, you know, what that means, okay? So we'll talk about that in a couple sermons on the road. But anyway, Revelation chapter 5, we see this book. We see the, this book with these seals, and they can't figure out who's worthy to open these seals. You look at verse number 5. It says, one of the elders, one of these elders, said unto me, Weep not. No, look at verse number four. I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So you have this book, and it's sealed with seven seals. You ever think about like a, like a scroll or something that's sealed with the king's you know, the king's stamp and he, it, with the wax seal. It's these seals need to be opened in order to open this book. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the 20 uh, elders fell down before um, the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are prayers of the saints. And it says, Thou art worthy to take the book, look at verse number 9, to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and has redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred, by thy blood, by thy blood, out of every kindred, every tongue, and people, and nation. So obviously this is Jesus Christ, is who we're talking about, that is going to open this book. So all that to say this, that's Revelation chapter number 5, but all that to say this, Jesus Christ himself... And people need to realize this today. Even Christians need to realize this today. Jesus Christ himself will dictate the beginning of the end times. There's this weird doctrine that you'll see amongst, not so much uh, people that we know, but like amongst, you know, Christians where they think that they're going to usher in the end times. You know, you have, uh, 
You know, the Jews, a uh, group of Jews rebuilding the third temple are not going to, it's not like God's in heaven and he's like, you know, doing something else and then he sees that a group of Jews has rebuilt the third temple and he's like, oh, I guess I got to go now and, and start the 70th week or whatever. No, Jesus Christ is the one that will dictate the end times, all right? God is going to decide when the end times start, and it will be Jesus himself that begins to open the seals, all right? Not anybody, not some technological advancement or whatever, okay? It's just going to be at God's choosing, and Jesus Christ himself will be the one that begins to peel the seals off of the book, all right? Now, go to Daniel chapter number 9, keeping your place in Revelation chapter number 6. So now we're going to look at the four horsemen of Revelation chapter 6, and it all begins in the last verse that we studied in Daniel chapter 9, talking about the 70 weeks of Daniel. So look at Daniel chapter 9, and look at verse number 27. Daniel chapter 9, look at verse number 27. The Bible says in Daniel 9, 27, and he, now we know from our study last week that this is the Antichrist himself, and he shall, and I mean the Antichrist, okay? There's many shadow, I mean, there is many, many, many shadow fulfillments of Antichrist leaders out there, all right? You could argue that uh, most leaders have been Antichrist leaders, all right? But look at verse number 27. This is talking about the end times antichrist and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week this is talking about the last 70th week the end time 70th week and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that that determined shall be poured upon the desolate talking about the desecration of the temple and all of that but first he confirms this covenant with many. There is this Antichrist that comes to power, and he makes a treaty or some sort of deal with many. Not all, though. The Bible does not say he makes a covenant with all. This is not the end times one world government. It's just the beginning of it. It is important that you know that because the four horsemen themselves explain how we get there, all right? Go back to Revelation chapter 6, and let's begin. All that was introduction. Let's begin looking at these four horses that are listed and their riders that are listed in, verse, uh, in Revelation chapter 6 in these first few verses. So the first one is this. Now the lamb, now it's called the lamb. We know this is Jesus for sure. And when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard it, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened, okay, that's the first seal. So the first seal uh, applies to or corresponds to the white horse. So if you look at your chart, you're going to see we're going to go white, red, black, and then I didn't really know what the letter or the color pale is, so I made it like a gray, all right? So that's where, that's where that color comes in. But we're starting out with the white horse, and we see that a crown, the key verse here that matches Daniel chapter 9, 27, is a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering. So this is the rise to power of this end times leader that is the Antichrist, all right? And look, he's a recognized world leader, and he has the power, look, it says he has the power to make War. So, look, that's something different because there's, there's a lot of world leaders today, all right? There's a lot of world leaders. There's the, the Secretary General of the United Nations. There's, you know, the World Economic Forum. Who runs that? Uh, Klaus something? Is Klaus Schwab? I mean, there's all kinds of world leaders out there today, but they all don't have the power to make war. So this is the Antichrist that comes into play. He makes this covenant with many, with many nations, uh, many world leaders, and he literally has the power to field an army, to make war against people that he chooses to make war of. All right? So that's the first thing. That matches Daniel chapter 9 and verse number 
27. Just this rise to power of this real powerful world leader. Now, look, there have been world leaders like this before. I mean, there have been world empires before. So an interesting thing that I want to point out tonight when we go through these four horses is I want you to be thinking about, like, what were the people that went through some things in the past, that went through empires in the past? What must they have been thinking? And was there a way for them to figure out if the times they were living in was the real Daniel 70th week end times? And I'm going to show you that there, there is. Okay, there's definitely a distinction, but there's been many shadows of this is what we need to understand. So we have this world leader. He's not some, he's not the king of England, you know, some figurehead that doesn't really have any power. He is a real leader. He has real power to make real war. He's got a real military behind him. Okay, so that's the first one. And look, there have been those before. I mean, Hitler? I mean, there have been those before. Stalin, I mean, there's been real world leaders that have real armies. Even the United States is a real army, is a world power, has the ability to make war. Look at verse number three. Look at verse number three. Let's look at the red horse, the red horse. Look at verse number three. It says, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. Look at verse number four. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and, they should, that, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So that is a very key verse right there, too. So here we see that now this leader rises to power, the white horse. And then you see with the red horse that this leader actually takes war to the entire world. So, I mean, the Bible is literally calling here, it's literally calling world war. It's saying that peace will leave the earth. You know, look, that has happened before. That has had shadow uh, fulfillments as well. But it's interesting, it says, you know, he's going to take peace from the earth, signifying a world war, but then it says, there was, it was given unto him a great sword. So, this world leader took peace from the earth, and he had great it's not talking about a literal sword here, where he just had a sword and he's going to go do world war himself. It's talking about he had great power. Okay? He had the ability to make great war. And I mean, look, most people agree that the next, and I'm going to kind of prove that to you tonight just through just logical analysis, but most people believe and pe most people understand that the next world war will involve nuclear weapons. Like pretty much 100%. Once the world goes to war again, because here we see this Antichrist has a covenant with many. It implies that he wants a covenant with all. But in order to get from many to all, he has to go forth and conquer. Now look, here's another interesting thing. And it's going you know, to be through nuclear war, basically, is what we can deduce from you know, what we're seeing today, what we see with technology, and what the Bible even says here. But here's what's interesting. Here's an interesting note about this. The Antichrist, the bad guys, so to speak, they win this war. I mean, I don't, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, do you? Look, God wins in the end, but when it comes to the Antichrist going forth to conquer with this great power... He wins this, this war. So, I mean, there's a lot of people out there today like that have been talking about nuclear war and World War III and all these things in the last few months. And, you know, you'll hear things like, no one wins a nuclear war. And, I mean, I get that. I understand why they're saying that. Like, no one wins a nuclear war. But here's the thing. The Antichrist wins this one. He does accomplish what he was trying to accomplish. So... The question is, you know, we've seen shadow fulfillments of this before. We've seen world wars before in just the last 120 you know, years or 110 years or whatever. There have been two world wars. So how could people have known that Hitler, if you just think about that time, when Germany was just going forth to conquer, how could people know that Hitler wasn't the Antichrist? And I'm going to explain that to you this evening. Go to Revelation chapter 6 and verse number 5. So we see that here the Antichrist rises to power, white horse, 
And then the next thing is he actually uses that power to go to war and take peace from the entire earth. That's the red horse. Okay, now let's look at the black horse, which is the results of this war. I mean, I'm glad that God gives us this detail in the black horse. It's not good news, but it definitely shows us that, you know, these past world wars that we were in were just shadow fulfillments. They weren't the actual end times Daniel's 70th week. They weren't the end times Antichrist. Look at Revelation chapter 6 and verse number 5. The Bible says in Revelation 6, 5, it says, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Okay, so this is something different. And heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now, hopefully you all listened to Brother Trevor's sermon a few weeks ago. You'll understand what this means, but I'll just explain it to you. Turn to Matthew chapter number 20. So it says, let's just look at that first, that first uh, statement. It says, so we see the Antichrist has risen to power. He's taken peace from the whole earth. And then it says, now we see a, a pair of balances in the hand of, you know, the rider of this black horse is this guy that's holding balances in his hand, and the balances show that a measure of wheat is a penny. You say, well, what does that mean? Look at verse number 20 in verse, uh, Matthew 20, verse number 2. This is the, the parable of the laborers, and the laborers that, you know, some worked for many, many hours, some worked the whole day, and then even those that just worked one hour got a penny. It's a reference to salvation. It's a reference to people getting saved, you know, at that last minute or whatever. There's lots of different applications of that parable. However, I just want you to look at verse number two to make my point here. It says, when he agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. So even the people that started working in the morning, he said, I'm going to pay you a penny a day. So basically, a penny signifies a day's labor. All right, now, what does a measure of wheat, you know, signify? A measure of wheat is, you know, I don't know, a quart of wheat or whatever it is, but basically what you're seeing here is that a day's provision of food costs a day's labor. That's what the Bible is telling you in Revelation chapter number 6. Now, all the men here and all the ladies that know what your husband makes every day, just do the math on that. Just be like, what do I make every single day? And what if I had to go to work every single day just to feed my family for that one day? It's basically saying you have to work to survive day to day because that's what things are going to cost. I mean, I, the Bible here is talking about massive inflation. Is what it's talking about. And it's talking about, you know, when it says don't hurt the oil and the wine, it's talking about these things being scarce, being precious. It's like protect them, take care of these things. They're hard to get. I mean, so the Bible is literally here talking about how expensive things are getting. During what? During this time where peace has left the earth and the Antichrist is going forth to conquer with this great sword or this great power. Now, look. Inflation is, is basically dependent on supply and demand. And it's totally understandable how this could happen during such a great war. I mean, the, the, probably the best, simplest explanation of, it, of inflation that I've ever heard is that inflation is when you have too much money chasing too few goods. So that shows you right there that two things could cause inflation. Look, we have inflation today. We have inflation in the United States today. I'll give you an example. I went out and I bought um, OSB sheets the other day. And last year, I had a project where I bought OSB 4x8 sheets. They're kind of like plywood, not really, but they're cheaper plywood, basically. I went out, I had a project one year ago. One year ago. It was my infinity shed that everybody would hear me talking about all the time. And I bought these same OSB, shed, these OSB sheets, and I remember specifically, because I budget out my projects and I try to, you know, I don't want to be the guy that was building a tower and then it's like, oh, you know, I built a third of my tower and now I'm done. So I budget out things and these sheets were $12 a, a sheet last year. I went and I got them on Friday and they were 24. So that's 6% inflation if you do the math on that. 
Isn't that what the, oh no, actually the government tells us inflation is 3%, right? I mean, I just went and looked at a fishing pole that used to be, I always look at this fishing pole. Jacob and I went to Big Five Sporting Goods um, just a couple hours ago, and I always look at this fishing pole because I'm always like, you know, I always like that fishing pole. I just look at it. It's, it was $120 usually when I look at it. This year it's $157. If you do the math, 3%, 120, 157. That's government schooling math right there, okay? So the point is we're seeing inflation today, all right? But it doesn't take us a day's labor to feed our families, all right? Thankfully, all right? So the Bible here is calling out massive inflation. You have too much money chasing too few goods. The reason we have inflation today is the first one, because we have too much money, because the government just prints money and they just make more money instead of being responsible and spending what they have in their ta you know, from their tax base. They just want to give money to everybody. Politicians are cowards. This is only going to get worse, all right? Just to give you a heads up there. But in the end times, it's going to be more the other side of things. It's going to be a shortage of things. It's going to be, you know, there may be money out there, but there's going to be no goods out there. And when there's no goods, supply and demand, when supply is like almost nothing, demand is very high and prices go through the roof. All right, so that's what's going to happen. Look, and this has happened in wars before. I mean, this happens in every emergency. There's some kind of shortage of anything, right? Remember toilet paper? Wasn't that weird? Wasn't that strange? Like nobody cares about steaks and, and hamburger, but all the toilet paper's gone for some reason. I mean, I was just like, this is, this is beyond, this is beyond bizarre here. You know, you can survive without toilet paper. But anyway, that's beyond the scope of this sermon. Anyway, so the consequences of war is what we are seeing with the black horse. We're seeing the consequences on what? Are the, are this the soldiers in the war that are having a hard time feeding their family? Is this just like the, the guys in the trenches that are fighting the war and they're like, oh man, you know, rations are really expensive now. No, this is the people. This is the people. But again, this is very common in war. What people forget about in war is, I mean, just think about the consequences of war in general. Just think about the black horse in, in any war. Just go and look up any war, statistics, casualties, deaths of any war throughout history. If you just look at, like, uh, just think about, like, the, uh, people don't realize this in America, but we'll get World War II. In World War II, the population of Russia was, like, I think it was a little less than 200 million. And in World War II, they lost 27 million people in Russia. 27 million people. If you do the math on that, it's like... 14% of their population died yeah. in that war. And guess what? About eight and a half million of that was military people fighting. You're like, eight and a half million only? What about the other deaths? Famine, civilian deaths uh, through the war. I mean, just like an invading army killing civilians. And then famine, disease, and starvation is always way, I don't care what war you look at, but famine, disease, and starvation in the civilian populations is always way more than any combat deaths. Any war will tell you this. So you look at, I mean, people are like, oh, 450,000 Americans died in World War II. 27 million Russians died. You wonder why they don't like Nazis today? Are you joking? They don't, for, you know, they remember this. Imagine how World War II, we have, you know, I, my generation has grandfathers that fought in World War II. Many of them are, are gone now. Both of my grandfathers are gone now. But you think about, you know, just 14% of the population. That means everybody knows somebody that died in that war. Probably everybody has relatives that died in that war. When you start looking at percentages that are that high, it's one in seven people in the nation. You think about that. But look, again, back to my point. Famine, disease, civilians killed is always a way bigger number than combat deaths. That's what you're seeing with the black horse. You're seeing this, the, the consequences of war 
on the whole entire general population. Combat, you know, is just a scratch on the surface when it comes to wars, all right? Go back to Revelation chapter number six. Go back to Revelation chapter number six, and now we get to the horse that, you know, pop culture, you know, likes the most, right? The pale horse, all right? The pale horse. But the pale horse, and I, I grew up in the 80s, and my dad loved westerns, and I've seen every John Wayne movie, and I've seen uh, all the, but guess what, folks? The pale horse is not Clint Eastwood. The pale horse is not Kurt Russell. You know, the pale horse is literally death. It is talking about the death of a significant portion of the world. Look at down at verse number seven of Revelation chapter number six. So we see the white horse is the rise to power of the Antichrist. We see the red horse is that Antichrist taking that power to war with the world, taking peace from the earth with the power that he has. And we see the black horse, we see the consequences to the population of the world. Things are scarce, things people need. They can't get them, they're too expensive, there's nothing on the shelves, all of those things. All right, look at verse number seven. It's inevitable that this next horse is coming with this conditions, with conditions like they are. Verse number seven, it says, he opened the fourth seal. And I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. Verse number eight, and I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with what? With hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. So here we see that, I mean, people don't have... They don't have, I mean, look, when the beasts of the earth are, are overtaking people, they, people don't have resources, they don't have supplies, they don't have electricity, they don't have food, they don't have water. Like, literally, the animals are retaking, you know, the earth at this point. But it's widespread death. A quarter of the people on the earth are killed. That is a major difference right there between this world war and all the other world wars. So that is like a main indicator that we could look at if we were in, you know, World War II times, we were in World War I times, we could definitely look at that and we could say, you know, okay, this is not the, a quarter of the people on the earth are not being killed here. All right, we can, we can see that. But look, today, today the population of the earth, just think about these numbers for a second. Like I, whenever, whenever I, uh, I, I like, Probably the biggest war I read the most on, and I still do, is the Civil War. And I don't know why. I just, I just like reading about the Civil War. It's fascinating to me. But honestly, when you read about World War II, especially, you really have to kind of dose yourself on, on reading about that. Because there's just like the numbers of people that are killed in mass graves and all these different things and all these different countries, they're, they're, they're mind-boggling. But even those numbers are, you know, nothing compared to these numbers here. And I'll show you that. I mean, today, the, the Earth's population is about, I don't know, let's round to billions, all right? So it's about 7.9. We'll just round it. We'll say 8 billion. We're talking about 2 billion people are going to be killed in this war. I mean, I remember, um, I don't remember this, but I've heard about this in 1968. You know, the, the world population is 8 billion people today. In 1968... The world population was 3.5 billion people. Okay, so it was like less than half of what it is today. And in 1968, there was this huge book that came out called The Population Bomb. And it just, it drove this huge movement of like, we're, the world is overpopulated and we're all going to die. We're going to starve to death. It was kind of the global warming of the day. And people just went crazy, like, there's just not resources enough. We're going to run out of oil. We're going to run out of gas. We're going to run out, you know, we're going to run out of food and all this stuff. But actually what happened was the more people that were on the earth, first of all, we're not going to end it. You know, if people don't believe the Bible, they don't understand that truth. We are not going to end the earth. By, you know, driving my Jeep that gets 12 miles to the gallon is not going to end the world. All right? It is God that's going to end it. The world is resilient. God will decide when it ends. But anyway, what's interesting is the more people that came on the earth, 
the more efficient everything became. Crop yields went up. I mean, I remember even my grandpa's generation helping my grandpa harvest, and I still remember the numbers. It was like he would go and he would farm a wheat field, and he would get 30 bushels to the acre of, of Durham wheat. And that was a really good crop. Now, if you're not getting 70, you're not farming right. And you say, why is that? Because machines are, have made things more efficient. You know, not only have you know, as science and fertilizer and things like that gotten so much better, but I mean, it's just even the delivery of goods has become so much more efficient. And look, that takes people to make that happen. You know, Amazon's not operated like by some computer. There's people that make that happen. We know some of them. But there's people that make that happen. Because there's so many people, now we have this great efficient delivery system around the world. We have this great mechanism for supplying all these different goods all across the world. This, isn't it fascinating that you can order something like from your computer at your house that's made all the way across the world and it can literally be at your house in like a day, sometimes the same day? I mean, it's, it's, but we have 8 billion people here. And people in California, you know, you can see why some of these ideas come from California. I've heard Bible-believing saved Christians be like, man, we're running out of space. We're running out of room. You just need to drive east for about three hours. That's all you need to do. And you're just, pretty soon you're going to be like, oh, we're running out of land. And you're going to be like, where did everybody go? I haven't seen a person or another car for two hours. What's going on here? I mean, you get into states where it's like next exit, 40 miles. Get gas now. You ever driven through Kansas? I mean, we used to drive through Kansas all the time, and I would want to drive through Kansas at nighttime because it looks the same at night as it does during the day. All you have to worry about is deer, hitting deer. But anyway, that's not really the point of the sermon. But look, look, go back to World War II. The population of World War II was 2.3 billion. It's 2.3 billion people. The total deaths in World War II was, I mean, if you want to, it's hard to get the exact numbers, but if we just overestimate, total deaths in World War II are about 80 million. So 2.3 billion, which is 2,300 million, and then you look at, you know, 80 million people, that's about 3.5% of the population. 3.5%. Look, that's a lot of people, but it's not 25%. It's not even close. If you do the math on World War I, it's even less. It's like, I think like 40 million people died there. The, the population is estimated at like, you know, they don't even really have good population numbers for the world then, but they estimated at like just a little less than 2 billion. It was like 2% of the world population died in World War II. But it's kind of interesting how you can see that ramp up with World War I to World War II. What was the change? The whole world was still at war. Well, the change was what? The change is weapons. The change is weapons. What got better? Weapons got better. We simply got more efficient at killing people. Because when the whole, look, here's the thing. Here's the thing. World wars. World wars are unique. And I want to point this out. And this is how we can definitely say that World War III, the next world war, will be a nuclear war. And we don't want to do that. But you can say that because all world wars have been different than the other, other wars. They have been total war. World wars are total war. Not all wars are total war. You look at the US fighting in, in Vietnam, and you look at that war, that was not total war. There was, you know, I mean, the, the United States decided to, we're just going to leave. We're not just going to go and just totally annihilate, you know, North Vietnam. We're not going to do that. So most regional wars are not total war, but world wars are. Meaning, what do I mean by total war? Uh, look at, look at the, the, and here's something I change, I've changed my mind on since I got saved, by the way. The bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, if you would have talked to me when I was 25 years old, I knew a lot about this. My grandpa fought in the South Pacific. If we invaded Japan, he was probably going to be one that was going to invade Japan. There's been many studies. There's been many studies. I mean, we firebombed Tokyo. We firebombed all the supply lines. We were starving out Japan. 
And that's exactly what we were going to do. We were going to starve out the population of Japan, and then we were going to stage this massive invasion of hundreds of thousands of troops into the island of Japan. But what do we know about the Japanese soldiers from the fighting in the South Pacific? They don't stop fighting. They didn't quit. You had to go and dig out every single last one of them, and they all, basically all of them fought to the very end. They fought to the death. They found some like 30 years later, still on some of these islands, thinking the war is still going on. But they didn't quit fighting. So the U.S. estimated that the casualties going in to invade Japan would be millions and millions. I forget the exact numbers, but they did studies on it, and they figured that, you know, many millions of people were going to die both Japanese, I think some of the highest estimates I saw were like 10 million people, like Japanese and, you know, invading armies. So when I was in my mid-20s, I was like, yeah, well, of course. Of course, we needed to do that to end the war. We saved so many lives by nuking these cities, right? But, I mean, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, you know one thing. You know that you can't, you know, the methods matter. The means, you know, oh, it's a means to an end. You know what? Methods matter. Methods matter. There is no reason to go and just murder civilian populations that is acceptable to the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever the circumstances. You can't just go and just bomb Dresden or Hamburg or these cities where, you know, it was nothing but civilian targets and we're just going to kill. I mean, we killed more people firebombing cities in Germany than we did at Hiroshima and Nagasaki just to try to just punish the enemy into submission. And those were just punishment, in my opinion, because the war was basically over at that point. But the point I'm trying to get at is none of that really matters in the scope of what I'm talking about because world war is total war. And world war will always be total war. I mean, you think about a nation fighting against a nation, and one is going to literally take over the other, this nation is literally going to do anything it possibly can to defend itself. And as soon as, you know, it looks like, hey, we have no other choice, they're going to pull out all the stops, and that's how you end up with this total war. And guess what? It's not just us that has nuclear weapons at this point. Many, 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 many nations have nuclear weapons. Yeah. So this is going to be a total war, and it's going to be... A nuclear war. So I believe that's what, you know, the great sword is talking about here in Revelation chapter 6. But again, I mean, it makes sense. A world leader trying to put sovereign nations under his rule, a rule that they don't want to be under, they're, they're going to pull out all the stops. And that world leader, that antichrist, is going to pull out all the stops to get them to submit. But again, I'm not trying to scare you tonight. A quarter of 8 billion people is 2 billion people are going to die. Some scientific estimates, you know, that you'll see with total nuclear war, they'll say, well, 5 billion people are going to die, dur you know, during that nuclear war, nuclear winter, which is a, you know, nuclear winter is kind of a, um, it's a theory, okay? It's a theory. I'll just, I'll just leave it there. It's a theory. But look, there's going to be mass casualties. There's going to be mass starvation. There's going to be mass, all these things. 2 billion people are going to die. But guess what? People will live. People will live. Six billion people, 75% of the population will live. But the good news is this. So, I mean, again, back to Hitler. So, Hitler, is he the Antichrist? If you were during that time, like, you could look at this and clearly see, like, hey, you know, two billion people aren't going to die, or, you know, a quarter of the earth is not going to die here, right? That's not what is happening. So, you could look at the Bible even back then and say, nope, not end times, if you just looked at the details of this. But again, go back to the first horse. This is not something that is going to happen overnight either. We haven't even seen this world leader come on the scene. We haven't seen a world leader that has this kind of power to make you know, all these nations come together and go to war against the rest of the world. So we'll see this leader rise to power. That's the white horse. We will see him make a covenant. We will see some people going along with it, some people not. We'll see many people, the Bible says in Daniel 9.27, going along with it, some people not. Then we will see this war ensue. See, so the study of the end times is really a study of a timeline. You really have to pay close attention to what is going to happen first, and then next, and then next. 
and then next. And then the Bible gives us this great detail about numbers, about things that are going to happen, all the way down to the economics of the situation. So it's all about God's timeline as well. All right? So all this, by the way, is leading up to God's wrath and judgment upon the earth. So this is just this is just evil men. There's a reason it says death and hell followed because most people when they die are going where? I, I don't I'm not happy to report that, but the vast majority of people are going to die without Christ in that death. Those 2 billion people, the vast majority of those people unfortunately are going to go to hell. That's why the Bible says death and hell followed with him on that pale horse. So it's our job, as we see these four horses listed here, this isn't going to be a surprise that comes in five minutes. You're not going to wake up, you know, tomorrow, and then all four horses are going to come, you know, in a week or something like that. You know, it's, um, it's something that's going to come over time. I do believe as it happens, if it happens in our lifetime, I hope it does not. I hope it doesn't happen in my children's lifetime or their children, my children's children's lifetime. But... If these things start to happen, it's not, again, it's not going to be this secretive thing that just pops upon you that you didn't see. That's kind of the point of this sermon series is, number one, if these things happen, you will recognize them. But number two, and probably the most important, is to quell people that are like saying, oh, it's happening. It's like, no, it's not. Read the Bible. You know, it's not, you know, the Amazon technology is not the mark of the beast, you know, and all these things. People just see one thing, they see one shadow, they see a world leader, they see Hitler. I'm sure there's plenty of people saying he was the Antichrist at that time. And we were in the end times at that time. All right? But this is all man messing things up, the Antichrist coming in, and guess what? He's going to win this war, but this leads up to God's wrath and God taking over, and we know who, well, we'll find out who wins in the end. All right, God's wrath and judgment upon this earth. All right, this is not the judgment of God. That's another thing that people misunderstand. This is the Antichrist doing these things. This is not the judgment of God. So what's our job? Our job is to just watch. You know, our job, as I said this morning, is to stand in the gap. So God may look down upon this earth and say, well, you know, there's a few thousand faithful people down there in the United States of America going out and preaching the gospel. Maybe this stuff can be delayed. You know, God has done that in the Bible. God has delayed his judgment because of the actions of leaders, of people of, that, were, that were choosing to stand up, preach the word of God, stand in the gap for the Lord. And that's our job. That's what we should be doing. So that's the four horsemen in the book of Revelation. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.